Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hi, so we are going to be talking about respiratory tract infections and bacteremia. As you know, the respiratory tract is divided into the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. And the various diseases which can occur are sinusitis, tonsillitis, pharyngitis, laryngitis, tracheitis, bronchitis, bronchiolitis, pneumonia and pleuritis. Today's lecture, however, will be restricted to pharyngitis and tonsillitis. So, the objectives of today's lecture are to first of all know the causative organisms of pharyngitis, discover the classification of streptococci, see the clinical presentation of pharyngitis caused by group A streptococcus pyogenes and determine its laboratory diagnosis, understand the epidemiology of the GAS, pathogenesis, treatment, learn about the other diseases caused by group A streptococci as well as the complications. So, when you look at the organisms causing pharyngitis, as you can see I have enumerated the viruses first, because they are responsible for 95 percent of cases of pharyngitis. In the remaining, we have the group A beta hemolytic streptococci, Corine bacterium diphtheri, group C beta hemolytic streptococci, mycoplasma pneumoniae, chlamydia pneumoniae and Neisseria gonorrhoeae. Fusobacterium necrophorium is one anaerobic organism which can also cause a devastating pharyngitis. Let us look at the classification of the streptococci. Depending on the oxygen requirement, streptococci are divided into aerobes and facultative anaerobes and anaerobes. In the anaerobes, we have the pepto streptococci. Coming to the aerobes and facultative anaerobes, based on hemolysis on blood agar, these are classified into alpha hemolytic streptococci beta hemolytic streptococci. So, alpha hemolytic are the ones which show partial hemolysis as is observed over here. Then you have the beta hemolytic streptococci which show complete hemolysis and the gamma or what are referred to as the non hemolytic streptococci. The beta hemolytic streptococci are further on the basis of Lansfield classification which is based on the carbohydrate antigen of streptococci divided into A to W except I and J, in which we are going to be talking about the group A streptopyogenes. Now, these group A streptopyogenes are further classified based on Griffith's classification serotyped based on the MTR proteins. So, as I said, it is the group A streptococci that we are going to be concentrating on. So, we will start with the case study. Aisha, a healthy 10 year old who had a sore throat for 3 days, complained of difficulty of swallowing as she left for school one morning. Later that day, she became feverish and looked flush and had to be picked up from school and taken to the pediatrician. On examination, she was flushed, had a temperature of 39.9 degrees Celsius, her tonsillar and the vical lymph nodes were enlarged. Her pharynx was diffusely reddened and when she was asked to open her mouth, her tonsils were enlarged and showed the presence of greyish white exudate on the surface. Three throat swabs were collected. One of them was subjected to a gram stain. 
and what was observed was gram positive cocci about 0.5 to 1 micrometer arranged in chains as well as some other scattered cocci. However, this was not really helpful for the diagnosis of a group A streptococcal infection because streptococci form part of the normal oral flora. So, what test other rapid tests can we do? We can do the rapid antigen detection test. In this test, the throat swab is dipped in a medium provided by the manufacturer. After that, a test strip is dipped in the same solution. We look at the test strip and see whether the control and test bands have appeared. If both have appeared, it means that this particular sample was positive for group A streptococcal antigen. A little word about the rapid uh, uh, test for antigen. This is uh, a very specific test, but not so sensitive and therefore, it becomes necessary to also cultivate the organism. The third swab should be transported immediately to the laboratory and plated immediately, but in the case of Aisha's pediatrician, since the laboratory was at a distance, he had to put the swab in Pike's medium in which it was transported to the laboratory. On the same day in the laboratory, the swab was plated on blood agar and a selective medium a selective medium which contains crystal violet, nalidixic acid and cholestin sulphate which tends to inhibit the growth of the other organisms present in the oral cavity. These plates are incubated at 37 degrees Celsius in the presence of 5 to 10 percent carbon dioxide because streptococci are organisms which are capnophilic. On day 2, Beta hemolytic colonies were observed on blood agar and when a smear was prepared, again you could see gram positive cocci arranged in chains. Further, certain tests were done to identify the group A streptococci. In these, we had the catalase test which was negative. The catalase test helps us differentiate streptococci from staphylococci, the latter are catalase positive. So, basically the test consists of dipping uh, the colony in hydrogen peroxide and if bubbles appear then it is considered catalase positive, if there is no effervescence it is catalase negative. The next test which was done was bacitracin sensitivity. Here test sample is plated on the upper part, the lower part has a control and after 18 hours incubation you see a zone of inhibition around the bacitracin indicating that it was sensitive to bacitracin and therefore, they were group A streptococci. Biochemical identification, the next test is the PYR hydrolysis. This is a substrate which gets hydrolyzed by group A streptococci and when we, uh, when we rub a colony on a filter paper disc containing the substrate, you get the appearance of a pink color. So, here again we got the pink color and therefore, Aisha sample showed the presence of group A streptococcus biogenes. Antimicrobial susceptibility testing. Now, streptococci by and large are sensitive to all oral penicillins and therefore, the drug of choice could be oral penicillin or amoxicillin. In our country, since the incidence of rheumatic heart disease is very high, it is necessary that we give injectable benzathine penicillin. Patients who are allergic to penicillins can be given erythromycin and other ma macrolides. So, most of the times an antimicrobial susceptibility test is not indicated. However, in recent times there are reports of penicillin resistant and erythromycin resistant strains and therefore, it becomes necessary to do a sensitivity test. So, now coming back to Aisha. So, after getting a confirmation for the presence of group A beta hemolytic streptococci, Aisha's mother was given a pres prescription for 10 days treatment with oral penicillin with strict instructions to finish the treatment irrespective of how well Aisha felt. 
within two days of treatment, Aisha started feeling better and as always happens, she stopped taking her medicine. When this was discovered, the pediatrician was very displeased. So, let us now understand more about the streptococci. How do people catch streptococci infections? Do they form part of the normal bacterial flora? And how does this organism cause disease? And why was it that the pediatrician was upset when Aisha had not completed her treatment? So, coming to the epidemiology of group A streptococci, these organisms are widely distributed in nature and form a part of the normal oral flora. Transmission can be exogenous or endogenous. Exogenous is usually droplet nuclei from another case or carrier to the respiratory tract through contaminated instruments or fomites and droplet nuclei which are directly passed into wounds, burns or abrasions. Endogenous spread is from the nose, throat and skin of carriers to areas of impaired host resistance, which could be congenitally damaged heart valves, wounds, burns or abrasions. Streptococcal pyogenes infections usually have two peaks. They affect children in the age group of 5 to 8 and another one which occurs at 12 to 14 years of age. How does this organism cause disease? So, we look at the virulence factors of group A streptococci. This is a diagram to show you the different layers present in streptococci. The first is the capsule, then we have the fimbriae, following which we have the M protein, the lipotechoic acid, group specific carbohydrate and the peptidoglycan. The lipotechoic acid, the group specific carbohydrate, the peptidoglycan and the M protein together form the cell wall. The peptidoglycan gives the organism its rigidity. Now, let us look at these virulence factors individually. Fimbriae and M protein are responsible for adherence. Capsule and M protein are responsible for the antiphagocytic activity and therefore, they help the organism in persisting. The group specific carbohydrate confers antigenicity. It is used to classify the streptococci. So, basically what is done is the streptococci are put into a liquid medium like tautie with broth and after a process of treatment with different chemicals, we extract this carbohydrate antigen and this is then made to react with anti-sera to determine which particular antigen is present in the streptococci. And this in group A streptococci shows cross reactivity with certain human tissues and is responsible for some of the post streptococcal infections. Additional virulence factors consist of enzymes, the ones which promote spread are streptokinase, DNases and hyaluronidase. Streptokinase as I am sure all of you are aware are also used for uh, dissolving clots in cases of acute myocardial infarction. Exotoxins, the exotoxins which can cause very severe infection in the case of streptococcus pyogenes are the pyrogenic exotoxin superantigens PTSA. These are also called the pyrogenic exotoxins A or C and were earlier referred to as erythrogenic toxins. Now, these SPEs are superantigens just like the staphylococcal TSS toxin. They stimulate T cells that induce a massive release of inflammatory cytokines causing fever, shock and tissue damage. Hemolysins and cytolytic streptolysin S and O are another group of exotoxins. 
So, let us look at the pathogenesis of a strep pharyngitis. The organisms attach to the pharyngeal mucosa by fimbriae and they colonize the pharynx. M protein and capsule prevent phagocytosis by polymorphonuclear cells, hence allowing the organisms to multiply. Many of these PMNs are destroyed by the leukocytic activity of streptolysin S and elaboration of streptolysin O. The remaining polymorphonuclear cells engulf the bacteria and produce an inflammatory response. The result is a sore throat, a septic sore throat, which will be represented by a pharyngitis or a tonsillitis with grayish yellow purulent exudate and additional cervical lymphadenitis and fever. Uh, now that you have understood the pathogenesis of uh, a streptococcal pharyngitis, at this stage I would like to tell you about the other diseases caused by this organism because everything is sort of interconnected. Now, the diseases caused by group A streptococci could be separative, toxin mediated or non-separative. In the separative, we have already done pharyngitis, tonsillitis. Then you have skin and soft tissue infections like impetigo, erysipelas, cellulitis, gynac infection like puperal sepsis. In the toxin mediated, we have streptococcal toxic shock syndrome necrotizing fasciitis or myositis and scarlet fever. Another group of important infections are the post streptococcal diseases which are non suppurative and these are rheumatic fever sometimes leading to rheumatic heart disease, glomerulonephritis and pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders. So, coming to the skin and soft tissue infections, impetigos presents as small papules, vesicules and pustules which form thick crusts and some of these strains are likely to cause acute glomerular nephritis. Skin and soft tissue infections like erysipelas is known to occur in elderly patients. They present with red, swollen, edematous, indurated skin with sharply demarcated edges and they are prone to repeated attacks. Cellulitis usually affects skin with a breach in continuity. The lesions are red, swollen and painful and there is an accompanying lymphangitis and bacteremia is common. Invasive group A streptococcal infections, these are the toxin mediated infections, predisposing factors, pre existing wounds, and diabetes. The organism penetrates the mucous membrane or colonizes a skin lesion, even something as simple as a bruise. And this can lead to inflammation and destruction of the fascia over the skeletal muscles, leading to a necrotizing fasciitis, and hence they are called flesh eating group A streptococci. These invasive group A streptococcal infections can also cause myositis where there is inflammation and destruction of the skeletal muscles and fat tissue giving rise to a galloping gangrene. So, these infections are usually caused by M1 and M3 serotypes. Remember the streptococcus pyogenes carbohydrate antigen a was according to Lansfield's classification, then according to Griffith's type, according to the Griffith M types, it is the M1 and the M3 serotypes which are known to carry the genes for the pyrogenic streptococci exotoxins. Streptococcal toxic shock syndrome is produced by group A streptococci which produce a pyrogenic exotoxin A. This is characterized by a scarlet fever like rash with desquamation, acute respiratory distress, shock and has a relatively high case fatality rate. So, in our case study, I had asked you three questions. Coming to the third question, why was the pediatrician concerned 
that Aisha hadn't completed her course of treatment. Scarlet fever is an important disease, not so common in our country, but recently there has been a spate of outbreaks in the western world. It occurs in all age groups, but most often in small children and is a complication of untreated streptococcal throat infections, where the group A streptococci is a pyrogenic exotoxin producing one. It is characterized by sore throat, fever, headache and large lymph nodes, a rash which is most prominent on the trunk, neck and extremities, reddening of the skin and strawberry tongue. So, what are these non separative complications? I have already enlisted those and these occur 1 to 3 weeks after an acute streptococcal infection. Rheumatic fever is seen after pharyngitis as is pandas and glomerular nephritis is seen after pharyngitis or after cutaneous infections. Rheumatic fever is an inflammatory disease that affects the connective tissue especially of the heart, joints, brain and skin and it is characterized by arthritis, carditis, chorea, erythema marginatum and subcutaneous nodules. Repeated attacks of rheumatic fever can lead to chronic progressive damage of the heart valves and it is believed to be due to cross reaction of the streptococcal antigen and antigens of the heart, especially the M epitope. So, you know the M protein epitopes resemble the heart tissue. So, antibodies which are produced against these epitopes will go and react with the heart muscle causing the heart valves or the heart muscle causing damage. So, these damaged valves, heart failure and atrial fibrillation are some of the presentations of rheumatic heart disease. In this particular picture, you can see thickened mitral valves, thickened chordae tendine and a hypertrophy of the left ventricular myocardium. In the laboratory diagnosis of rheumatic fever, we would look at the acute phase reactants C reactive protein and ESR. An ASO titer is done and a titer of more than 200 indicates a past streptococcal infection. Now, these antibody titers should be repeated two weekly so that you can detect a rise in titer. ASO titers as such rise in the first month after infection. They tend to plateau at six, 3 to 6 months and finally decrease after 6 to 12 months. A streptozyme test which detects antibody to a whole range of streptococcal enzymes like the anti-hyaluronidase, anti-streptokinase, anti-streptococcal anti esterase test can also be performed. It also indicates that the patient has had a past streptococcal infection. Acute glomerular nephritis, more common in children than in adults, secondary to a cutaneous or pharyngeal group A streptococcal infection and this is usually due to a nephritogenic strain of group A streptococci and the common ones are the M protein serotype 12 and 49. Pathogenesis, again it is an antigen antibody reaction, these complexes are deposited on the glomerulus of the basement membrane. They stimulate an inflammatory response which causes damage to the basement membrane and impairs the renal function. Clinically, the patient will have pallor edema, hypertension, hypoalbuminemia, urine will be rusty and smoky, proteins will be raised, there will be red blood cells, hence the rusty or smoky urine, WBCs will be raised. It is usually a self-limiting disease and repeated attacks are not known to occur. Diagnosis is again by demonstrating a rise in the acute phase reactants like ESR and CRP. A urine examination will, in, uh, will reveal proteinuria and RBCs will be seen. The streptozyme test again would be positive. ASO titers are increased in about 60 to 80 percent of the patients. But more importantly, 
a rise in anti DNAs B titers of more than 300 are very significant of a post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Coming to prophylaxis. Now, prophylaxis is given for rheumatic heart disease. Remember the treatment the doctor gave Aisha a course of oral penicillin for 10 days. So, that is very important. You can give oral penicillins, uh, you can give cephalosporins in those who are allergic to penicillin you would give erythromycin, but long term for rheumatic fever you have to give so that you prevent rheumatic heart disease from developing. And so, here you give long acting penicillins, erythromycins or sulfadiazine. It is not necessary in glomerulonephritis because it usually occurs as a single infection. PANDAS is pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with streptococcal infections. It occurs in children who overnight after a streptococcal pharyngitis suddenly develop an obsessive compulsive disorder and aortic disorders. Now, this disease is believed to be as a result of antibodies which affect the brain especially near the basal ganglia. And what happens with these children is that uh, this particular obsessive compulsive disorder or the tick disorder may just increase for some time and then gradually disappear. So, to summarize, although viruses are the most common agents causing pharyngitis, group A beta hemolytic streptococci should be suspected in patients who present with a sore throat without a runny nose, who have had pharyngitis with or without tonsillitis and show enlarged cervical or tonsillar lymph nodes. Diagnosis can be done by the rapid antigen detection test. Culture on blood agar would show beta hemolytic colonies with the identification of group A streptococci can be done by doing the catalase test, determining its sensitivity to bacitricin and positivity to PYR. We can also do an extraction of the antigen and uh, determine the presence of group A streptococci. However, this is tedious and therefore, we depend upon the more easily done bacitrescin test. Group A streptococci are susceptible to penicillin and can be easily treated. However, penicillin resistant strains are being reported now. Besides pharyngitis, group A streptococci can also cause cellulitis, impetigo and erysipelas. Untreated group A streptococcal pharyngitis can lead to acute rheumatic fever and damage the heart or lead to scarlet fever. Pharyngitis and cutaneous infections can lead to acute glomerulonephritis, which both these conditions are a result of cross reaction of streptococcal antigen with heart tissue or glomerular membrane respectively. Scarlet fever is produced due to strains containing pyrogenic exotoxin and the other toxin mediated diseases are acute necrotizing fasciitis or myositis and toxic shock syndrome.